You see, music has finally become portable for me with this UHA CR210, which was built in 1983 and even has an extra compartment for two extra cassettes, which is going to give you around four and a half hours of non stop music on the go. Okay, I admit it's not exactly a Walkman really, but still, because it is UHA, this thing is basically built like a tank. It's built for reporters and for use in the fields and thereby, although it's quite crammed inside, full of mechanics and little relays and switches and stuff, it is still built to a very high standard, second to none really. Although everything is built to a very high quality, there are still a couple of parts inside which are going to perish over time, like the belts for example. So in this video I'm going to tackle these problems and although it's going to be a little bit lengthy, I still encourage you to have a go and take a look inside this thing with me together. So let's go! So you can see it comes in this very posh leather case and you can slide it out of there and together with it comes also a charging unit which you can put into the battery compartment so you can also power it through the mains line. So we can plug it in and see if it's actually going to do anything. Put a cassette in there and actually nothing happened. You can see not even the battery meter is responding Fast forward, rewind, no hiss, nothing, not even a motor sound, so clearly there seemed to be something wrong with the power supply. And sure enough, putting the leads of a multimeter on there, you can see it's absolutely dead. So first step is of course to check the fuse, and sure enough, it was completely blown out. So I put a new one in there, checked it again, and there was still nothing happening. You could see 0.5 volts there, so I thought something must have been wrong inside. Open that up and inside we find an electrolytic capacitor which after all these years is of course completely dead. Having replaced that we end up with roughly 24 volts DC which seems a little bit high because according to the manual you can either use this power unit or a 12 volt car battery as a power supply. And so I did a little bit of research online and found a circuitry which was able to convert pretty much any given AC voltage down to 12 volts DC. And after a little bit of fiddling that actually was a really nice fit inside. So having installed the circuitry and closed the lid on there we end up with roughly 12 volts DC which should do the device a lot better. Since that cap was blown I also figured the ones in the device were shot. So I removed five screws in order to remove the top and be careful with the speaker leads they're still connected and have to be unplugged. And then you remove two more screws from the bottom in order to gain access to the circuit board itself. Then I had a peek at the capacitors there and sure enough they were completely blown out. You can see 0.5 nanofarads on one and 2.02 on the other. They're completely shot. So I soldered these ones out of there. Now be careful here there are two wires connected to each of the capacitors and they have to go back where they belong. And the black one up top I was able to put that into an empty space on the circuit board so it's no longer in the way. The original capacitors were rated at 10 volts and since they are filtering 9.8 volts DC that seemed a little bit tight for me so I replaced these with 16 volt rated capacitors and they should be able to cope with that just fine. Now when we put a cassette in there and put the deck down then you can see that the motor is actually starting to spin which is a very good sign and when we press play now then you can also see the relays are starting to switch. Now they are switching back and forth because they are not registering any movement in the cassette and that's because the belts are perished. In order to get access to the belts we have to remove the front cover and we do that by first removing all the little switches and knobs there and then there are three screws at the front and you can lift that out of the way. Next step is to remove these three circuit boards that are in there. You can just slide them out by hand and then don't forget to also put out the plastic insulating shield. We now flip the machine on its back in order to remove the loading mechanism and it's held in by three screws which are marked by arrows and then there is a fourth marked screw for a circuit board and when we remove these two countersunk screws up top the mechanism should come right out. Be careful with the small plastic door there. Now we can also remove the small circuit board and bend it out of the way and then we can start removing the belts. 
The first one connects a counter, that's the simplest one. And unfortunately, the main belt has come into this almost grease-like substance. It's completely stuck to the wheel and I had to be really careful removing all the stuff and not getting it on any other of the components. So I'm just working my way here, being careful not to get anything spread into the machine and to do as clean a job as possible. Having removed the vast majority, I then lifted the entire mechanism out of the way and you can see that the small little belts just pop out of there and then can be picked out. And the next step is then to meticulously clean the brass pulleys of any residues because whatever gets onto the new belt is going to make them sticky again. You want them as shiny as possible really. Now you can see this black plastic piece there keeps these brass pulleys from falling out. So you have to kind of pre-place these belts here. And the same goes for the main belt. You want to do as much work as possible before lowering the assembly back down. It's still going to be a very fiddly job. So you can see it goes around the leftmost pulley and then just uh, touches the other, the right pulley and then place it back into the bearings and you can start working on fiddling the front belts into place and my fingers are in the way most of the time it's just not easy to show you can see i'm trying to put it around the motor pulley here but one big trick here is that you can actually tilt the mechanism up quite a bit in order to gain access and to manipulate the belts the way that you want them to. Having done that, I then pursue by putting the lid back in place and hooking the spring under. Then I carefully place the thing back on its side and holding it with one hand I screw the mounting bolts back into place so that it can't fall out. A really cool gimmick of this device is its speed control and you can see these reflective patterns here printed onto the main pulleys and when we have a look at the control board sitting above it, you can see one lamp here, which is to light up the cassette room. And underneath are four diodes, and two of them are emitters, and two of them are photocells. And they're actually uh, looking at the reflection of the pulleys, and thereby giving feedback to the motor. So we can put that back into place. And we can also move the circuit boards back where they belong. And don't forget to put the plastic insulation sheet in there. We're now ready to do a little test here. Um, and we switch the device on and bridge this little micro switch here. And then we can move the play switch left to right and see that the pulleys are actually turning. And um, we can also put the fast forward or rewind lever into its respective positions and check whether everything is working fine. And it seems to do that, so we can switch it back off and reinstall the loading mechanism. In order to do that, you'll have to also push back this little linkage here, which moves back the tape head and aligns it with the mechanism. You also have to align this little dowel pin and the hole in the assembly so that it can freely slide up and down. So we carefully put it in there and then with a the screwdriver manipulate the lever into place. Put the two countersink screws in there, put the front cover back in place and of course also reassemble all the knobs and dials on it. Okay, I'm all excited. Let's put the top and the bottom covers back on there. And uh, by the way, the round screws are going on the tops and the flat screws on the sides. So let's put a cassette into there and load it in and have a little listen. So that was absolutely terrifying. Turns out this phenomenon is called flutter and it's caused by the pinch rollers which are slipping because they've hardened up over time. In order to gain access to the pinch rollers we have to remove the sound head assembly 
And in order to do that, we first have to disconnect these small little cable connectors here, being careful not to snap any of these tiny wires. And the next step is to remove these small countersunk screws and then the whole assembly just lifts up. You can see that the sound head is snapping forward, that'll have to be re-engaged later on, but it's really not that hard. And for now we can swing it out of the way. To remove the small snap rings takes a little bit of patience, but they'll go eventually, just be careful. Then you can just lift these small pinch rollers up and out of the way. Now they had little brass bushings pressed into them and I carefully hammered these out using a brass drift because I wanted to mount these somehow in order to refurbish their surface. Now I did that by just using a screw and then chucking it up in the lathe. You could use a drill and heck you could even sand them just by hand being very careful not to create any flat spots. Very quick little job, make sure to clean them and of course to press the bearings in. And the next step then is to remount them on their riding pins. Now the snap rings again, they are very finicky little things and I was glad that I had magnetic tools for this one because if they are lost inside the device then they are never going to be found back. Realigning the sound head is actually not that hard, you just lift it up and over the little pin that's sticking out and it's back in place and then you can re replace these little countersunk screws and of course the cable connectors. Okay so I'm really excited so let's put this thing back together put a cassette in there and see what it's actually going to do. Okay, that didn't sound too bad. So one last thing I want to check is the record function. So let's quickly talk something onto here. It has a built-in microphone. And let's see how that turns out. Well, it appears that the Uber device is working fine again, along with the recording function and the microphone. So I hope you found this video interesting and thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.